The Triathlon Show 295. Up, everybody, welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Dr. Ed Maunder and Dr. Stephen Seiler. Ed and Stephen join us to discuss the concept of durability, which they've uh, discussed and investigated in a recent research paper from this year, from 2021. A durability essentially means how little or how much your physical performance deteriorates over the course of uh, prolonged endurance exercise. Also, when does that happen? Does it happen after two hours or after five hours? We will discuss the ins and outs of durability from both a theoretical, scientific standpoint, but importantly, we'll get into plenty of practical tips and takeaways, like how do you actually train to improve durability, uh, which uh, I think is a, a really important message from this episode. I just want to give you a heads up that for a large part of the interview, it's uh, just uh, Dr. Ed Maunder and myself, and then Dr. Steven Seiler joins pretty late in the interview, but he will he will come in towards uh, the latter part of, of the interview. But before we get into it, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Roka produce exceptional quality wetsuits, dry suits, swimskins, goggles, performance sunglasses, as well as prescription eyeglasses and sunglasses. In their eyewear category, they have uh, plenty of uh, really cool features such as the Geeko anti-slip technology, but also in the purchasing process, they have an online vision test for prescription updates and they have home try-on options available for eyeglasses. Roka ship from the US, the UK and EU and they are trusted by world leading athletes such as Lucy Charles Barclay, Javier Gomez, Flora Duffy, Morgan Pearson, Summer Rappaport and many others in triathlon as well as cycling, speed skating and many many more. Visit roka.com forward slash TTS for 20% off your order. And thank you to Senate. The Senate Indoor Swim Trainer is a tool for time crunch triathletes looking to improve their swimming specific strength and technique. The Senate Swim Trainer is trusted by the BMC Pro Triathlon team, by age group triathletes, coaches and physios around the world. And until mid-August, you can get more than 40% off the Senate Swim Trainer when you combine the ongoing summer sale with the special 20% discount that you can get on senateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. On that page, you'll get a discount code that you will then add at checkout, taking that total discount to more than 40% off. So now is a really, really good time to shop for the Senate Swim Trainer. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Dr. Ed Monder and Dr. Steven Seiler. I'm here with uh, Ed Monder. Uh, Ed, welcome to the Triathlon Show. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure. Can you start by just giving an introduction to yourself for the listeners? Tell us uh, what uh, what you're doing, where you're located, and, and a little bit of your sporting background. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm uh, now a lecturer um, at AUT, which is Auckland University of Technology in, in New Zealand. I'm originally from the UK, studied um, at the University of Bath and the University of Birmingham. Um, and then I moved across um, from the UK to New Zealand to do a, to do a PhD, um, which which I've now finished, um, and and yeah, working working at AUT since then. Um, my research uh, relates to endurance sport for um, an endurance exercise, rather I suppose for for health and, and for performance as well. And uh, the one one thing that you have been researching recently that uh, that is the main topic for uh, for this interview is the concept of durability. Uh, can you explain what you mean by durability and uh, why it is important for endurance uh, sports, at least in in many endurance sports, it is. Sure. Yeah. So I think briefly, I would define durability as sort of an athlete's uh, resilience. Um, to deteriorations in their exercising physiology over time during very long duration exercise. So in terms of why that's important and worth thinking about, so I'm, it, as well as being a researcher and work in applied exercise physiology too, so do a lot of work with um, endurance athletes. And one of the main roles that we have 
um, is profiling an athlete's physiology. So getting someone into the lab um, and providing them with information about their exercising physiology to provide training zones, that sort of thing. And we'll typically do that with an athlete that comes in well rested and we'll give them threshold powers and heart rates and that sort of thing. So those numbers are potentially useful um, to apply for, for training, but, but of course many endurance athletes are doing very, very long duration um, training sessions. So whether those numbers actually are still useful in the third, fourth, fifth hour um, of training um, is a question that really um, we're sort of only just beginning to unpack yeah uh, that's uh, that's an interesting uh point that you mentioned there with uh with the third fourth or fifth hour and i think in your paper which we'll link to of course in the show notes it's called the importance of durability in the physiological profiling of endurance athletes you mentioned that as another aspect of uh, the definition of durability i guess is when the deterioration starts to happen not just the so the the time point and the magnitude of it if you will the combination of those two uh, and uh, when you profile these athletes, uh, how much do you find, and this can be a very qualitative answer, we can get into quantitative, how to quantify it a bit later, but do, do you find that this differs very much from athletes even within the same sport and discipline? Or, or is it something that at the top level, a lot of athletes are kind of similar? Uh, what's your sort of just qualitative uh, uh, take on that? Yeah, so my my take on that would be that there is quite a bit of variation between athletes, even at similar uh, in within similar sports. So you take a long long distance triathlete, for instance, there might be some who are very resilient to changes over time, um, and they have very stable physiology across long bouts of exercise. And there might be others who are um, more susceptible to to, for instance, increases in heart rate at a constant power over over a long period of training. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I think it's quite an important um, concept for us as, as researchers to be concerned with, as I do think that it's it's a trait that, it, that is different between athletes. Yeah. It's uh, one of the implications of uh, this concept of durability is, of course, racing performance. Uh, it makes total sense that if you are more resilient to changes to deterioration in your physiology then you're more likely to be successful in in long distance endurance events uh, but uh, you mentioned there the training aspect as well uh, and can you maybe go a bit deeper into more detail on how might you if you're an athlete or a coach even take the durability and the resilience of the athlete into account when planning training and how might it benefit you to know the durability profile of an athlete when when mm. planning their training Yep. Yeah, so there's a course, sort of a few different um, aspects of that that I think are worth considering. So the first first might be, as an exercise physiologist, if you're profiling an athlete, you might give someone a lactate threshold, power or pace, and, a, and an associated heart rate value, and then you might um, the co- a coach may use those numbers to plan training sessions in order to to keep an athlete within a given intensity domain during during training sessions. So you might go out for your long um, ride at the weekend or something uh, and and decide that you're going to keep your power below 200 200 watts for, for, for instance or or a heart rate of 140 or something now one thing that i'm sort of is is quite surprising that we don't really know the answer to from the research yet is whether those um, heart rate values are stable with very very prolonged exercise so we can suspect um that the work that you'll produce at those thresholds will, will decrease to to a greater or lesser extent and with prolonged exercise but we don't really have a good answer for whether that um, cardiovascular drift we see during long duration exercise um, matches the drift in our in our exercising physiology so that's something that i think we need to um, an assumption that we make that that's research that needs to needs to um, be done uh sorry can you can you clarify that so the assumption is that the uh, or uh how how do you would you assume that the cardiovascular drift might or might not relate to uh to the underlying uh, physiology there and uh and and where does the training prescription and how you how you do the training prescription uh come into that i, I wasn't quite following okay sorry so the um if we identified an athlete's um lactate threshold for instance occurred at 
heart rate of 140 beats per minute. An assumption we might make is that in order to maintain a low physiological stress response over a long duration training session, a strategy to do that might be to maintain our heart rate below 140 for the duration of that session and let whatever happens to the power and pace happen. Hmm. Sort of a heart rate controlled approach. Now, if we were to we're measure... About, we're talking about the, the first lactate like, threshold in, in this example. In this example, rather yeah. Than a second. Yeah. 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 So, and we can be relatively confident that, that when we, early on in an exercise bout, when we cross that heart rate value, we're going to drift physiologically above that first lactate threshold. Now, whether that heart rate value is the correct value to be using in the third, fourth, or fifth hour of a training session is, is something that we don't know. So it's an assumption that we make and the research still still needs to be done. Yeah. Well, you'll know, know this much better than I do. I, I did actually, funnily enough, just a coincidence, not related to our interview, read some papers about cardiovascular drift uh, just last week. And, and there were some interesting papers and a summary, I think, by, by Ed Coyle was particularly interesting where he he kind of argued that uh, that a lot of cardiovascular drift is just explained by hydration status hyperthermia status and uh, and even uh, glycemic uh, blood uh, blood glucose status uh, so so that was an, an interesting take by by him that if you control those factors then you see a kind of quite a small cardiovascular drift if if, if any but uh, but i'm sure that you've looked into into this much closer than i do so uh so so they yeah i mean your point there is that we still it's not it's not really clear we need more research to to really figure out what's going on there yeah absolutely and, th- and those factors that you mentioned may acutely impact an individual's durability as we as we termed it yeah so maybe let's go into that so what are the potential mechanisms behind uh, why one person may be a lot more durable than another uh, the and the moderating factors as well uh, like like temp- hyperthermia environmental conditions and and uh, hydration status and so on yeah so the in terms of the underlying physiology i think it's probably fair to say that again we don't we don't really know um, the answer i suspect that fiber type profile might have um, something to do with it so athletes who are more slow twitch or more type one fiber um, in their in their makeup are probably more prone to be more durable. That that would be uh, my um, best guess. Um, there may be something related to our oxidative machinery. Um, so having more mitochondrial protein within our muscle may may be useful for durability. But again, um, not sure. I'm not sure that again that research needs to be done from a training perspective um and this is just in my experience i think it does seem that you need to do very long duration training in in your training program in order to develop those those durability characteristics if you're never going beyond an hour or two in your training sessions it's unlikely that you're going to respond um, well in that third fourth or fifth hour of of exercise compared to someone who does do that regularly mm, yeah no that makes makes perfect sense and uh and what about moderating factors uh, so we mentioned a couple there already the environmental conditions like heat could could have an impact and uh, uh hydration status are there any other any other that you can think of um, which within an within, within an individual uh, from one week to the next, for example, could could impact their durability. So maintaining carbohydrate availability um, could could well have a have a moderating influence there. I think um, there has been a small amount of research done in that space. So if you're better able to maintain carbohydrate availability to fuel. Um, your exercise it's likely um, that those durability characteristics will be improved so i think that's something that um, athletes can pay attention to for sure yeah um the the paper that you wrote it's um it's it's a it's a review like paper i would say you do have some some data there that is collected through uh online through twitter essentially uh so just field examples Mm -hmm. uh but uh but you do summarize uh, a lot of the 
the data that exists previously that uh, that can kind of be classified as within this durability concept. So can you go into a little bit how much data or literature exists around this and uh, and what about the field data or anecdotal data uh, that you've seen like how how much do we really know about it and how much or how much don't we know about it how how little or how much exists yeah um so i think short answer would be that there isn't a huge amount of data on this point um which i think is a problem and that's something that in my research i'm trying to address um we the sort of the physiology of long duration exercises of, has seen a lot of research um so there are some inferences that we can make um from that um that data so for instance there's some good evidence that your running economy or your gross cycling efficiency so how efficient how economical you are in your movement that that will decrease um over time and i think that has very strong implications um in durability because if you if you imagine that you're becoming less economical um, as exercise progresses, and that that just means that a given energy expenditure metabolically will produce less speed or will produce less um, watts on the bike. So um, there are some some assumptions that we can make from from that data, which is quite compelling. Um, some of the other data that we discussed in the paper, so there was a good series of studies that was done in the UK at the University of Exeter, and they looked at um, critical power and how that changed um, following a couple of hours of quite um, decent intensity exercise. And, the, and through a, and a range of different models, they showed that your critical power um, during during a cycling three-minute all-out test decreased um, as a result of a couple of hours of exercise and there was some moderating influence of of carbohydrate intake um, in that series of studies so that was some some quite interesting data that was there i think one of the key um, bits of information that we had in the field data that was collected and then presented in this paper um, was from a relatively large group of of cyclists training indoors um, probably during covid lockdowns and things um, and, that, and they they cycled at a constant work rate for four hours, so quite a moderate sort of intensity ride um, that lasted a full four hours. And um, they measured their heart rate um, and how that changed over the course of that four hours. And you could see that there was quite a lot of variability in the degree to which heart rate uncoupled from power across that four hours. So some people um, maintained a relatively steady heart rate across the full four hours. And whereas there were other individuals who saw quite large increases in heart rate um, towards the end of that four-hour constant load um, ride. So I think that's quite compelling information in that um, this is a trait worth considering in coaching and in sport um, because it's something that's going to differentiate different different athletes. Yeah. In that four-hour, uh, the, the group that did a four-hour ride indoors, you, you had – an, a really interesting way of quantifying the the durability or the or the change in uh, or how how the physiology kind of progressed through that ride with uh, the measuring the or calculating the internal to external workload ratio by using percentage of heart rate reserve uh, divided by the percentage of six minutes maximal power that the cyclist could could produce and then you could you could really see these three groups one with a really kind of, kind of low decoupling between the, the the internal and the external load and then one group with a moderate and one group with a high uh, high decoupling and uh, and those yeah th- those characteristics are really drastically different in those three groups but i i think that it was just a, a really smart way of of quantifying it using heart rate reserve is uh, i guess maybe the best way we have of kind of use as a proxy for actual oxygen co- consumption uh and uh, and then the percentage of six minutes maximal maximal power is obviously a very very safe way of quantifying the external load power is a very uh, very good stable metric for that so so that was just something for uh, that i wanted to mention for the listeners to consider as well this is something that they can maybe self experiment with during during a long session it's not that difficult really to create your own field test if you will and see 
see how you do where you stack up right now and uh, and then see how you progress if you do some specific training interventions as well to to address your durability yeah for sure and i've got to give credit to um steven siler who was who was one of the authors on the paper and that was certainly um his means of quantifying um those changes in internal to external um workload across that four hours and i think i agree it's a very um i think that is quite quite a useful way of certainly quantifying field data so i would encourage um cyclists in the field um to, to use a similar could, could could potentially use a similar approach and um, to monitor that um durability characteristics yeah yeah and I, th- I think there again it's worth pointing out that you did also uh ask these uh uh these cyclists to uh to to provide their body weight before and after and fluid consumption so that you could control for for that as well so that's mm. something if if a listener wants to do this field test themselves i i would say that yeah that's something that you should definitely do to make sure that if you have a large heart rate increase that it's not because you're completely dehydrated but actually you you kind of control the level of dehydration that you experience uh, and and make sure that it's it's not uh, at least uh, a majority of the heart rate decoupling is not related to to just being really severely dehydrated yeah absolutely Okay, and uh, and other than than this particular uh, means of quantifying and assessing durability, also you mentioned the critical power uh, decrement after a prolonged endurance exercise. Have you seen and used any other means of assessing or quantifying durability in in the literature or when you've been working with your own field data? Yeah, so in terms of validated assessments um, from the literature, I don't think there are um, a sort of, a sort of strong um, availability there. But I do think, um, particularly for for athletes who who do perform very long duration exercise, so your yeah, long distance triathletes would be a good example. I think performing any kind of athlete testing, but following a prolonged period of exercise, so rather than doing a doing an assessment when fresh, whether that's a 20-minute power test um, or a laboratory-based um, assessment. And rather than doing that fresh, doing that after two two or three hours of, of training, um, that might be a good means of appreciating these, these durability characteristics for sure. So looking at um, the drop-off in whatever metric it is that you're testing yourself with um, when it's done after um, a, a multiple-hour um, bout of exercise. Yeah, in in the critical power data that you mentioned, uh, what was the cohort there? Were those recreational athletes or or elite athletes? Uh, what I'm getting at here is, is there a benchmark in elite athletes of how how good your durability can get, or is that something that we're lacking currently? Um, from memory, uh, they weren't elite athletes. Um, and and no, I don't think there are strong strong benchmarks there available. Some sort of normative um, values like you might have for VO two yeah. max or something. No, there's certainly not certainly not um, that data available yet. Yeah, all right. But but even so, I think uh, the point there is is a, a good one. Uh, athletes can can self assess after doing prolonged exercise and and just see how if they're developing in in that regard and and i think it's we all kind of intuitively know if we still have room to improve in that third fourth or fifth hour and and if that's something that can can be developed and to be honest i think that as you say for most amateur athletes anyway it is something that can be improved because we just don't have the ability to train as much and do as many of those long sessions as as elite athletes do so if even elite athletes uh, probably a lot of them can still improve it but then that would mean that almost all amateur athletes probably have some room for for improvement it doesn't necessarily mean all like that you have to do five hour training sessions every week or or so but uh, but i guess being smart about training and maybe we can get into that uh, other than uh then increasing the amount of long duration training you do. Do you have any other suggestions for how to go about improving durability? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question and one that I would certainly like to know the answer to. Um, there are there are lots of different strategies for manipulating um, 
exercise training variables, I suppose, that have been studied. And certainly, I don't think, um, that, again, this, there is data um, in the literature to tell us the answer there. Um, other than going going very long, um, I'm would be scratching my head to know to know what a good um, recommendation um, would be. I think the way that we respond to exercise, we need to put ourselves um, physiologically in the situation. So that's a sort of specificity of training adaptation. So if there's some means by which um, we can make uh, shorter duration exercise have similar traits to 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 longer duration exercise um, then that might be worth exploring whether that includes uh, whether that might include for instance um, including some higher intensity efforts to deplete your energy stores and things earlier on in a in a training session to make the the subsequent hour um, more long duration exercise like if you like that 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 might be one way one way of doing it but again um, th- this is certainly just speculation at the moment. Yeah, uh, I, I find anecdotally that just the overall training volume uh, plays a huge mm. role here. And this is without even formally assessing durability, but just kind of the eyeballing test, I guess, of athletes' performance and, and durability and and how it relates to their training volume. Uh, I, I think that maybe if you train at a higher volume, your always uh, a little bit more uh, fatigued starting a session and and that kind of simulates what you go through even when you do a a single long duration workout so so you might get to that sort of point of experiencing what you might experience in the fifth hour of a bike ride slightly earlier if you have the previous day done three hours of of training uh, of some form uh, which might be kind of moderate or hard intensity uh in in at least part parts of it so so i think that training volume overall even if you can't do those really long sessions can maybe have a have a positive impact on on developing durability from a coaching perspective sure and just on that i wonder if the the sequencing of your exercise your training throughout the week as well might be a way to do that so if that means rather than if you've got an amateur athlete who traditionally trains each evening there might be some opportunity to train an evening and then the following early morning. And that might be one, one means yeah. by which generating that um, long duration exercise response um, without it actually being individual long, long training sessions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, another concept that you mentioned in the paper is uh, around high intensity repeatability. Can can you explain that, define that, and uh, and how does that relate to durability? Yeah, so um, conceptually, I think quite similar um, to durability, and that means that, uh, but in a high intensity exercise context. So you could have two athletes, for instance, who have similar capacities um, over shorter distances. So whether that's five, ten minute type efforts. Um, but you may have one athlete who's more able to back that up, recover and come back and do it again um, than another athlete. So that's what high intensity re- repeatability is about. Um, an athlete's capacity to repeatedly perform bouts of higher intensity um, exercise performance. Yeah. And how uh, you quantified that with some field data as well. Do you want to explain how, how you did that? Um, yep. So there was some some data included in that paper from a high level um, mountain bike um, rider, and you uh, could we sort of just quantified their um, power data from a from a world championship event, I think it was, um, and you can just see the amount of work that they were able to perform above that threshold or critical power. So this is that um, exercise intensity domain that is inherently short-lived, so um, where you cannot maintain um, steady-state physiology. So that that athlete was able to accumulate a huge amount of um, work above critical power across the event. Um, and that's like or must mean that they were able to recover very effectively during the um, intervening short periods of, of much lower intensity work. So that's likely in certain events going to be a defining feature of what makes one athlete very successful and another another less so yeah yeah you wrote in the paper that uh well they 
obviously the athletes uh critical power and w prime their anaerobic battery uh for listeners that uh might not uh know about w prime it's kind of the energy that you have to spend above critical power so so the critical power was 380 watts and w prime was around 40 kilojoules uh, but then you calculated that over the course of this 90 minute race uh he actually expended uh where is that 280 kilojoules of work above critical power compared to that 40 kilojoule which was his w prime which obviously r- relates to how much he could expend basically continuously going above uh, critical power but with the recovery that he got uh below critical power he was able to make it uh what is it eightfold uh, sevenfold uh of uh, yeah seven sevenfold the the actual size of his w prime over the course of 90 minutes so so that's where i guess as a listener maybe maybe it's something worth looking into if if you're racing that kind of racing especially like mountain biking where mm. where this uh, this is an important factor uh, how how much can you expend over the course of a certain duration and and how does that relate to the size of your w prime yeah i mean certainly no, from doing interval training that's so that's a that's a, a trait that you can see see change over the course of a, of a good block of training is that your um the power that you're doing in individual reps may not necessarily be that different early on it's just your ability to to repeat that and maintain those those higher power outputs in the sixth seventh eighth um, repetition that you're doing uh, may, yeah. may be improved and that that's something that yeah. that you tend to see with athletes quite a bit. Yeah. And do you think that this high intensity repeatability is it more related to aerobic development or anaerobic development? That's a that's a good question. Um, probably both. I would so fitter athletes, a bit athletes with a, a greater aerobic um, capacity, aerobic capabilities. Um, likely able to recover faster from um, high intensity bouts of exercise so developing your aerobic capabilities might help your your ability to recover but also developing your capacities anaerobically if you like so above that critical power or threshold um, that's going to increase the size of that of that battery as you put it earlier yeah yeah that makes makes perfect sense mm. right if you if you have a very minimal anaerobic capacity then no matter how quickly you can recover from it you're never going to be able to over the course of let's say 90 minutes expend a lot of anaerobic energy because yeah, uh, yeah just the uh, the amount of energy expended anaerobically is, is small so so they both would be important um in terms of practical recommendations uh what do you want athletes and coaches to take away as the key messages from from this episode and and generally from your work in durability that can be applied in training and or racing so i guess the main point is to draw athletes and coaches attention to this characteristic as something worth thinking about so as i as i mentioned in my in my work as a as an applied exercise physiologist we we tend to profile people in, in a well-rested state and make inferences about how they've adapted to training from, from those numbers. But really, we might not be capturing that in those well-rested assessments. It's going to be um, later on in a long-duration bout of exercise where we might see those meaningful meaningful changes. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And uh, what's next for you and for the scientific community as a whole Uh within the concept of durability uh, do you have anything cooking right now any any new projects or research going on yeah so we're developing some some projects at the, at the, at the moment to look at the physiological determinants um, of durability and why some athletes seem to be more resilient than others over over prolonged duration exercise and also trying to develop better means of um, measuring and um, quantifying that during during prolonged bouts of exercise is there anything you can mention specifically about that or is it uh, uh, still too early it's probably a little bit early um to give any uh early findings from that from that research <laughs> all 
All right. Uh, I, I want to ask you one more question, which is something we talked about uh, pre-recording, which is uh, some other research you've done with uh, regard to, to heat adaptation or training in the heat. Uh, you mentioned an, an interesting study that you've done comparing heart rate matched training in uh, uh, in the heat compared to temperate conditions and adaptation to that training. Can you just discuss what you uh, what you did there and uh, what your findings were? Yeah, sure. So we had um, two groups of cyclists train in either 18 degrees, um, which is quite a cool environment, or 33 degrees, so quite hot. And they did three weeks of training um, in those conditions, and their training was prescribed relative to their heart rate thresholds. So effectively, heart rate matched between the two groups. And then we took a range of performance and metabolic uh, measures before and after um, the training program. So despite the athletes who trained in the heat putting out less power during their training sessions because it was heart rate matched and the, and the hot environment would have um, increased their heart rate for, for given power outputs, um, the athletes who trained in the heat had better performance improvements, so greater magnitude of change in their endurance performance. Um, and that was assessed uh, with a 30-minute time trial um, that came after a two-hour um, constant load bout of cycling. And there was evidence of greater adaptation within the within the muscle in those those athletes who trained in the heat. So there may be some interaction um, with training under heat stress um, and metabolic adaptations to endurance training. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really uh, really interesting finding, and uh, I'm, I'll make sure to link to that paper as well in the show notes, so so listeners can go and have a look. And uh, now it looks like uh, we have uh, Stephen with us uh, as well. Uh, so welcome, Stephen. Uh, we've kind of covered most of uh, the topics that that we had on durability, but but I do want to ask you for your take on sort of practical recommendations uh, for athletes and coaches. Uh, from your perspective, what, what do you think are the important things to consider? Uh, what, to, what, what do you think people need to absolutely know about durability? And, and then secondly, how, how do you recommend people go about actually training it and developing it? I think the number one challenge for people is to uh, get out of their mind that they're fresh you know, let's call it their fresh FTP or their fresh five minute, six minute power, whatever the variables they are, they often train to these metrics and feel compelled to always try to improve 20 minute power. And that becomes the, uh, their key focus. And in reality, number one, that stabilizes fairly, fairly quickly in the career of an endurance athlete, a few years. And and number two, it's not a number that is relevant four hours into a race, or it's not totally irrelevant, but it's 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 not it's not the power they have available uh, when they're climbing the last climb of the fifteenth stage of the tour, uh, you know. And so that is why we need to be looking at durability, high intensity, repeatability, and athletes need to be conscious of the the deterioration that they're trying to manage that they're trying to both manage through training and manage in races now the next issue is well okay it's fine yeah so i guess the next issue is then okay Stephen, how do i train for this what's you know do i perhaps one of the key questions that's being asked right now is do i train fresh in other words do I use the, the typical idea, which is be ready, come into a high intensity workout, uh, rested and ready, or do I actually try to create the conditions and simulate the partial fatigue that is associated with having to mobilize uh, a high power output for 30 minutes on a long climb or, or something to that effect? several hours into an effort and and i and it's it appears that there are adaptations uh that we need to create these conditions or we need to stress the organism either, both at the cellular level and the systemic level in order to continue to extend that durability 
uh, whether the, the, the typical culprits that we uh, focus on are glycogen availability and uh, plasma volume loss through dehydration. But the reality is, is it, it's looking like it's more than that. There are other aspects to the physiology, such as reactive oxygen species, heat shock protein. Uh, there, there's a number of issues related to how cells manage and tolerate stress, you know, muscle cells. And I think we're just digging into the weeds there. Uh, so, so that's going to be exciting when uh, scholars like Ed, myself, and others try to develop studies that uh, both mechanistically explore this, but also uh, practically, you know, generate some guidelines and some tools for athletes to help them understand and measure, measure the durability, measure the high intensity repeatability. Because if you can't really measure it, then it is, it is more difficult to see how it's developing. And then two, develop, you know, some um, appropriate training, training methodology for it. Mm. Uh, so in terms of measuring it, I know that you have been involved in working with a, a training training monitoring platform. Uh, if yeah, if, if that's what we what we call it, is that something that you measure on that platform? It's is is it Endura that it's called? Yeah, well, Endura we we we've developed Endura more as a, a research tool, more as a to trying to go into the weeds, look at some of these issues. How do we? connect the internal workload to the external workload because that's one of the key issues is you know just conceptually you're trying to look at the relationship between the external workload the actual you know that neutral load that you're you're imposing on the body whether it's you know 80 percent of maximum lactate steady state however you want to express it as a load that's calibrated that's the load. And then you look at how does the body respond over time, not just the first 10 minutes, but over time. And so we've just developed a tool, you know, with ways of, of getting at that relationship and, and looking at how it's measured. And we've, we've generated some data, some data, some of that data early on, early days data was published in the study with, with Ed as, as lead author. And, you know, we're doing some more work in that direction uh, towards um, how do you how do you quantify that? Now, one of the ways you can quantify it uh, that we think is useful is just looking at uh, heart rate, looking at car the, that cardiovascular decoupling or cardiac drift. Uh, but there but there are issues there that you have to be controlled for. And when we, for example, controlled for dehydration, so that there's no differences in dehydration, we still see big differences in decoupling, meaning the the uh, relative amount of cardiac drift for a given athlete over a time at a given workload, a, 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 the same relative workload. Uh, so we're just trying to get into the weeds there. However, I don't think heart rate's good enough. Uh, it's not sufficient. It's important, it's useful, but it's not a sufficient tool, particularly as you move into more of the high intensity repeatability uh, challenge because once heart rate gets, uh, you know, up to 85, 90% automatically as a function of the actual demands of the workload, then there's, there's a ceiling effect. There is really nowhere for heart rate to go. So therefore you don't see a lot of drift just because it can't drift up above a hundred percent. So it becomes not a very, it's not a useful tool then to, to, as a metric of this, this decoupling so what is is ventilation uh is you know are there could we see things with uh, muscle oxygenation could we see things with emg you know these are questions that are being asked and you know there's many technologies that are being presented uh as potential tools in this environment and and you know they all come with some type of mechanistic potential but the the proof is in the eating and and so far you know we're we're still not in a situation where we can say yes this new tool it is informing that inter that process in a way that is fundamentally better 
Uh, I, I'm not ready. I haven't found that tool yet. I'm hoping, uh, you know, when we're exploring that, but uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit optimistic just on a, the issue of ventilation on breathing because breathing is a vital sign. It is like heart rate is one of the most directly accessible uh, variables that is telling something uh, about what is happening there and then in the in the musculature. In fact, ventilation is interesting because it is more keenly and directly connected to the second to second changes in the muscular milieu than heart rate because heart rate is almost a a central point of view, smoothed data type of window, whereas ventilation will move up and down and has a broader scope of change. So anyway, that's that's one issue we're we're pursuing. Mm. I, I'm going to ask one more question uh, of both of you, and that is, uh, if we look at this from a triathlon perspective, uh, half and full distance triathlon. How important is durability on the spectrum of uh, from uh, super fundamental to a super marginal gain uh, on if you want to, uh, I guess, look at it from that side? And uh, and is it different for pros versus amateurs? Uh, so, Ed, do you want to go first? How important is it? Is it super important, not at all important, somewhat important or yeah, and place it on that on that spectrum if you will and and then and and explain why you did so so we're talking about endurance sport so i would argue that it's super important absolutely i don't not that's not to say you can get away um without having your well-rested physiology um being impressive um but but i think to excel in a sport like long distance triathlon absolutely you need both you need to you need to be um of an ex- of a sufficient level when well rested but also but also in that seventh eighth hour of the ironman absolutely and for amateur athletes uh would you think that the relative importance is equally important as for professionals or is there a difference there um i would argue that they're, they're just as important for for pros as as amateurs now amateur athletes probably have more scope to improve their well-rested physiological profile, if you like, um, compared to pr- professionals who are, who are going to be plateauing um, at some point um, in in those measures. Um, so there may be, be maybe more work to do on that front in, in an amateur cohort, but but certainly the durability aspect is going to be um, more than marginal um, for a long distance triathlete, even at the amateur level. Yeah, and Stephen, uh, what's your take on it? Yeah, well, I agree with what Ed said, and, and I would just probably add that there is a filtering process. The high-performance uh, triathletes, elite level, they've been filtered up based on some physiology that probably gives them genetic advantages in durability, for principally a, a very uh, large slow-twitch uh, fiber-type ratio. Uh, and it looks that that probably in and of itself improves durability uh athletes that that have a a more mixed composition will probably have a greater fatigability uh, over time so what that kind of in my head means maybe is that actually the age groupers the the amateurs that are more let's just say nor typical more typical uh in terms of their uh fiber composition and so forth, they probably, they may have more scope for improvement, um, in that relative durability relative to their fresh physiology. Uh, and so, so yeah, for me, it's super important, but it's not just super important in the, in the triathlon, uh, triathlon, it's super important in, in essentially any event beyond a couple of hours, uh, durability and high intensity repeatability becomes an issue. And I guess the only thing I might add to all this is what's interesting. Although I work a lot with cycling and cross country skiing and sports where there is a lot of stochasticity, you know, this variation in intensity, uh, it seems like that's also becoming more relevant in the triathlon just because of the nature of the courses that are being built, tighter loops, more public friendly, viewer friendly, which means there's more 90 degree turns, there's more short spiky hills, 
So you have these courses that are potentially more, they, they generate a higher demand on a non, uh, a non even tempo. They, they demand that the athlete, uh, actually does, uh, charge up those hills and, and accelerate out of those corners, which puts a bigger demand on that, that high intensity repeatability, even in, uh, an event that I think cognitively we typically associate with a very steady pace. Yeah, I, I know for a fact uh, from talking direct, directly with Daryl Tveit and the coach of the Norwegian uh, triathlon, Olympic triathlon team that they have been uh, directly assessing durability in the way that we talked about with Ed earlier in the interview with just uh, doing a certain amount of work, which they do at a fairly high intensity, kind of almost simulating the race and expending a certain amount of kilojoules and then testing how their performance metrics, their physiology changes after after that to simulate yeah the the second half or the last quarter of of the olympic distance uh, triathlon so so that's something that they're definitely looking at which is no surprise knowing how closely they follow uh, the current uh, trends in science i guess so uh, so it is definitely coming there i i don't know we didn't talk specifically about high intensity repeatability but i would absolutely not be surprised if they're also looking at looking at that directly like you said uh, because yeah, what you're saying about the changes in courses and uh, uh, race dynamics in uh, in short course triathlon in sprint and Olympic is is absolutely true. And also there is this trend with uh, the Olympic uh, pathway triathletes doing more and more sprint distance races and uh, mixed relay uh, with very short events, super league triathlon, super sprints, and those sorts of things. So. Mm events are kind of becoming more skewed towards the shorter side where uh, where that high intensity repeatability i guess is is really important even if the duration of the events is not is not long but but in the olympic distance that certainly is the case it's almost two hours and then you still have all those all those corners all those sprints up hills and, and outer corners and and so on so so definitely uh, agree with what you're saying now uh let's uh, wrap this up and well, the uh, driver of all of that is television i think <laughs> oh yeah yeah for sure and it's going to be exciting just a few weeks from when we're uh talking we will have the first ever mixed relay in the olympics so so that will be really exciting um well, uh, Stephen, you've been on before and you've answered rapid fire questions. So I'm going to, going to ask these from Ed. And uh, this is just uh, uh, questions to ask, answer with one sentence. And the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports? I really like anything Alex Hutchinson writes. I really enjoyed Endure. I've been enjoying Mark Burnley's exercise physiology videos on YouTube recently. Yeah, those are both great resources. What's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Well, oh, I might be a little uh, early in my career to um, to talk about uh, advice on on being successful, but to do lists, daily to do lists, checklists. Um, are, it's a book book called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande um, that I took a lot from. And who's somebody that you look up to or that has inspired you? Ooh, um, my father um very uh well incredibly willing to think through a problem and that's something that i try um to emulate from time to time Mm, perfect and finally where can we follow you both uh twitter other social media research gate profiles that you keep up to date Uh, let the listeners know if they want to uh, to keep following your uh, projects and your research uh, yeah, I, I'm on Twitter, so that's Maunder underscore Ed, and then ResearchGate too. And Stephen? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter as well, just Stephen Seiler and uh, and ResearchGate. Uh, and then sporadically, I, th- I throw out some videos on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. All right, great. Well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you uh, both for uh, coming on, for taking the time. It was uh, really interesting to, to talk about this topic and uh, really looking forward to uh, reading any future uh, work that you're going to do in this realm. It's uh, definitely exciting to to see uh, where this develops. Thanks. Thanks very much. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. 
Uh, I want to just add one thing to it uh, after the fact, which is something that uh, I have discussed quite a bit before in, uh, for example, TTS Thursday episodes when discussing bike training and run training in particular. Check out those particular episodes if you want to go into more detail. But that is the concept of what I called in those episodes and what I tend to call fatigue resistance workouts, which essentially is uh, doing some hard work after having already expended uh, a fairly large amount of energy. So it could look like doing three hours of, of riding at zone two in a five zone system. So just endurance riding. And then after that, doing, let's say, 30 minutes of riding at around 7.3 race intensity. That's a simple but very effective example of a fatigue resistance workout that, that I use uh, a lot and prescribe a lot. Uh, so, so when you in the past have heard me talk about fatigue resistance workouts, that really uh, aligns very nicely with this concept of durability. And that's, that's sort of the, one of the main points that those workouts uh, do develop. Uh, so, so that's just to draw some lines and connect some dots for you. As always, you can find the show notes from the episode on scientifictriathlon.com with links to the papers that we mentioned, including the one that is about durability, which is a really good one. I highly recommend you checking it out, uh, but also Twitter profiles, research gate profiles, and so on, everything that we mentioned there. If you're interested in coaching services or training plans and want to take your triathlon performance to the next level, go and check out our services on scientifictriathlon.com or get in touch with me directly on email if you want to get more information. We would love to help you out and help you achieve your goals. Big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Senate. Use the Senate Swim Trainer to improve your technique, power, and stamina, and increase your swim stimulus frequency even when you can't go to the pool or the open water. Get more than 40% off your order until mid August when you combine the summer sale with the special discount code that you can get on senatesimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving it fast.